Hello and most welcome to 1743 of the Heidegger series. And we will today continue with the article Wittgenstein on Aspect Blindness and Meaning Blindness by Ohad Nachtomi and Andreas Blank. And we will continue where we left off in 1739. Page 68. Last time we discussed why seeing aspects is having meaning or understanding language. And that sameness and intention and similar things are also words in the language game. Very important to understand. And for words to be understood, they must be aspect driven. Otherwise, they will not be words as such. So in a way, everything is made of aspects in this world. Even sameness. It gives both a sideways view of things, but it also gives the wholeness. That place for the importance of both the language game and our possibility of perception, understanding. And we also brought up what it is to follow rules. What is rule following? In the earlier lecture here, where we discussed Sedmak and Locke, we un came to the understanding being a Christian and following morality is doing things. It's not passivity. It is following the rules and learning more and more how to become moral Christian or what our aim is, what sort of language game we are opting for. This is, of course, in enormous contrast to the old view of everything being absolutely passive and the Platonic Greek view. We also spoke about the wedge, the wedge, and how to be able to see that the wedge is actually pointing, the pointing ability of the wedge that is coming from learning the different aspects and I would say also to see uh, oddly enough this is uh, rather a little bit crazy but the edges of the triangle or the wedge is uh, pointing in the other directions left and right if we think of a triangle that's supposed to be pointing upwards. You can see or feel the left and right to be the aspects that build up the upward direction. So you see the oppositions is also what the different aspects do, does. To have a hill you need a downside, but you also need an upside. 
And I think we ignore that sometimes. Uh, we brought it up earlier in uh, lectures that regarded physics. And uh, that was the physics of contrafactuals. Things that doesn't happen or doesn't exist, like this, the, uh, the area between the spokes in a wheel that are completely empty, but at the same time are constitutive of what a wheel is. Learning to see the aspects also what doesn't normally constitute something is an important first step in understanding them. For instance, in recognizing a face, we have the surrounding areas of the face. We have the bits of the face that are covered by a hat, clothing, hair, shadows. There's a multitude of things that are, so to speak, contrafactuals or, if you like, non-existent. And those things are absolutely necessary for seeing and understanding. Without them, there can, cannot be a recognition of a wholeness or a oneness of a person. And this is one of those, uh, you need to train it almost to understand aspect. It's, it's not a one-time thing. You, you do it over and over again. And the more you train it, uh, the more clearance, the more, um, the more it will come to your mind to understand it. It's, uh, perseverance is to be recommended in this case. You'd be well advised also to remember what we went through with uh, uh, Barbara Tversky, where isolation, decontextualization, she called it, is an important feature of abstract thinking. So what at the first outset could be perceived to be negative is actually an absolute positive. A necessity. Lisa Batet Friedman also, as a neurologist, brought that up when she looked at emotions, that they have an other aspect. And uh, that is the aspect of planning, that emotions also are sort of mini programs that we made ourselves or that developed uh, in concordance with the surrounding environment and our small maneuvers of uh, a wits or a point for survival or benefiting one's life. These things can also be seen as games so do not fall into the trap that there is anything frivolous about the games. Just like football, they can be serious and even more serious, I would say. Well, let's start where we left off in 1739. It's the sub Rubric three, seeing aspects and following rules. We emphasized above the importance of the acute phase of aspect perception in relation to language acquisition. Without 
being able to learn to see under an aspect in the acute phase, we would not be able to see similarities in the chronic phase as we routinely do in common linguistic practices such as reading, counting, calculating, We now turn to develop and substantiate our suggestion by making the connection between aspect seeing and rule following more explicit. We suggest that following a sign, say an arrow, expressed thus, requires that we shall be able to see each mark as falling under the same aspect. In turn, seeing such sameness presupposes that our ways of seeing have been formed so that we habitually see as pointing to the right. This proposal implies that in order for one to grasp such a rule and to make the requisite similarity judgment on each case, one has to form a criterion for identifying the mark as an arrow that is as pointing. According to Wittgenstein, such criteria acquire a use of rules for making subsequent similarity judgments. In using such a rule, we come to ordinarily see under that aspect. In this way, we move into the chronic phase of aspect, aspect seeing, and routinely see 
according to a certain aspect. For example, before one learns to add the addition sign in 2 plus 2 might seem like two lines crossed. But once one requires the technique of adding numbers, one's way of seeing has been trained so that once one sees two plus two, in certain circumstances, of course, one immediately sees the plus as an addition sign. We could say that the adding technique has been assimilated into our ways of seeing and reacting. It has become part of our second nature in the sense that it comes to characterize the way we routinely see the sign and act accordingly. When a certain way of seeing becomes a habit and part of our second nature, we no longer need to interpret the sign or deliberate what we are to do. We simply go on blindly. This describes the normal situation in which our eyes are shut in the face of doubt. While doubt is possible, normally it does not occur to us because we are habituated into a certain way of seeing. This is behind Wittgenstein's famous paradox of rule following. While various applications are logically compatible with the rule, even such as a plus function, the practice of actually following rules is fixed in certain ways. Our point here is that the fixing of certain rather than other ways of following rules can be described in terms of aspect seeing and the shift from the acute to the chronic phase.
Wittgenstein discusses the connection between aspect seeing and following rules throughout his notes from the 1930s and 1940s. In his notebooks from the early 1930s, for instance, we find the following passage. I make for myself a plan in order to walk according to it. It does not suffice in order to understand the plan that I see the drawing and I see where I stand and the similarity between the landscape and the plan. I also must know what it means to follow a plan. Perhaps I have learned this through actually having followed plans in the past. But of this I cannot use the fact, but only something that I see in it. As I take for myself a rule out of the incipient series, one plus one, and etc. When we are presented with uh, some samples of a mathematical series, we might see the rule of the series, or we may need to work it out. To put it differently, deciphering the rule from a limited number of samples involves our seeing the examples as a pattern generated by a certain rule. This point is evident in the following passage as well. What does recognizing a law consisting obviously this process actually exists. I show to someone the series two times, four times, up to two and six, up to four, etc. And he says, yes, now I know how to continue. I see the law. Perhaps he had conjectured another law after the two first members and was surprised 
when he wrote down the third member, then he saw a new law. What is remarkable about this passage is that when we are presented with additional members of the same series, our way of seeing how to continue the series can change such that we begin to see the examples as compatible with a different rule. In this way, following a rule can be closely related to our way of seeing. In fact, in the early 1930s, Wittgenstein seems to regard the capacity to see something as a rule, as the hallmark of arithmetic. Because a rule is only what I see as a rule. Was ich als Regel sehe. In arithmetic, nothing can arise that I would be unable to understand. In his notebooks from the early 1930s, following rules is not only characterized as central for understanding arithmetic, but also for understanding a language. For example, Wittgenstein remarks about a projected book on which he was working with, working between 1930 and 1932. I believe it was the main thought, or at least one thought of my book, that one also has to be guided by the word red. This is why he states I regard meaning something, I regard meaning something and following a rule as synonymous. Here, the connection between following rules and meaning something is made explicit. If our practice of following rules is related to the formation 
of our ways of seeing through aspect perception than our linguistic practices are also related to the shaping of the ways of seeing through aspect perception. An examination of manuscripts shows that there is an important and little explore strand of thought in Wittgenstein's later philosophy that connects the following rules with ways of seeing. In a notebook from 1941, Wittgenstein discusses the way in which we derive a rule from going through a particular proof. Wittgenstein gives the following example. Imagine that you want to find out the result of eight times nine. One possible proof procedure consists in drawing eight rows of dots each and then counting the number of dots by pushing a chess figure along the rows of the dot. Such a procedure, as Wittgenstein puts it, shows one way in which 8 times 9 can have the result 72. As he notes, at first, the examination has been experimental. Now it is being conceived as a rule. And the proof is the picture of an examination. A certain way of seeing is fixed in a picture and becomes crucial for justifying a rule.
when this picture justifies the prediction that is when you only have to see it and are convinced that a process will take place in this, this and that way, naturally the picture also justify, justifies the rule. Seeing the proof in this way also leads to seeing other events in a particular way. From the picture, I only derive a rule of course, the picture does not show that this and that happens. It only shows that what happens can be conceived in this way. The picture does not show me that something happens, but that whatever happens can be seen in this way. Thus, if a proof serves to form a rule, we see other events according to this rule. More precisely, we conceive them as being in accordance with this rule or as it may happen, as not in accordance with that rule. In these remarks, proofs are ways in which our ways of seeing are fixed and thus serve for forming conceptual connections. As he notes, this must shows that someone has adopted a concept
And this is how Wittgenstein characterizes such a situation. This must means a circle. I decide to look at things in this way. Later in the same manuscript, something similar characterizes seeing a law in a segment of mathematical series. When I write down a segment of a series for you, and you then see this lawfulness in it. One can call this a fact of experience, a psychological fact. But when you have seen this law in it, it is no longer a fact of experience that you continue the series in this way. But why isn't it a fact of experience? For isn't to see this in it the same as to continue in this way? Only in this sense can one say that it is not a fact of experience that at this stage one declares the step to be the one that corresponds to the expression of the rule. Thus you say, according to the rule, that I see in this series, this is the way to continue, not according to experience, rather this just is the sense of this rule. What is crucial for Wittgenstein is the difference between seeing a series this when this way of seeing is understood as an empirical 
psychological fact and seeing a series when this way of seeing is understood as what defines continuing the series that is as a prescription for action This is why a certain way of seeing becomes constitutive of the sense we associate with the rule. You give an extension to the rule. You are, so to speak, in on it. In a 1944 manuscript, Wittgenstein takes up these ideas again. Here, too, he draws a close connection between the notions of following rules, forming concepts, and ways of seeing. Who follows a rule has formed a new concept for a new rule is a new way of seeing things. Wittgenstein describes seeing a segment of the series as follows. I see something in it similar to the figure in the puzzle picture. And when I see it, I say, this is all I need. Wittgenstein uses this passage again in the settle where he places it immediately after the enigmatic passage that appears in Philosophical Investigation 229. I believe that I perceive something drawn very fine in a segment of a series, a characteristic design which only needs the addition of so on in order to reach to infinity. Read against the background of the material from the 1941 and 1944 manuscripts. This remark may well be understood 
as referring to aspect perception. In the 1941 manuscript, Wittgenstein connects seeing sameness and following a rule. Acting according to a rule presupposes recognizing some uniformity. In the 1944 manuscript, he works out this idea. Doing the same is connected with following a rule. One does not feel that one always has to be attentive to a hint given by a rule. On the contrary, we are not curious about what rule will tell us now what the rule will tell us now rather it always tells us the same and we do what it tells us one could say we look at what we are doing in following a rule under the perspective of what is always the same. And here we put a remembrance because here we make a stop. The last words being Wittgenstein's emphasis. Now, when I go to the quotes, The quotes, the quotes. Let's see here, ladies and gentlemen. On page 69, uh, he introduces more or less the subject of aspect seeing as having meaning or having language, I would say. That's the second paragraph. And one sentence in. In using such a rule, we come to ordinarily, and listen now, see under that aspect. <laughs> In this way, we move into the chronic phase of aspect seeing and routinely see according to a certain aspect. So, a thing in the world is a certain way of aspecting. If I'm going to put it in the germ, so you, it's not needed, and Wittgenstein doesn't do it, but for, for you to see, it's a sort of happening. 
You remember the acute and the chronic phases of aspect seeing. The Swiss constructor of AI movement, Rudolf Pfeiffer, shows that things are ways in we move, in how we move, and his in that approach much close to the previously mentioned Anthony or Tony Chemiro, who's a modern day Gibsonian after James Gibson. It's a certain movement in the aspect seeing or something that later, after much repetition, becomes chronic. And you can replace chronic in normal jargon or argo with uh, existing or being an object. Or why not? The best, I would say, is real. Becomes really realer, if you can sort of put a superlative on that. Realer, more real. But it's a movement for every time you repeat it. Jacques Derrida called that iteration. And I remember we had an example of the Spanish word caña. For every time you repeat it, for every different way you repeat it, not the same. Sameness is an achievement that has a gradual aspect to it always. It is not yes and no sameness. It is becoming samer and in the same fashion it becomes more real. Page 70. He's helping out here with mathematics. When we are presented with some samples of a math math mathematical series, we might see the rule of the series, or we may need to work it out. It is, listen now, it's not there from the beginning. It's the aspecting that's happening. It's a practice or a praxis. The same as we said in the earlier lecture, Christianity is a practicing as is morality. Revelation is a repetition also or iteration. Reading it once will destroy it. Better not to read it at all. But the repetition makes it come alive because everything intelligent, as we now know from the science of cognition, is moving, advancing. And everything static is on the other way of the developmental line. Later on, there is at almost at the bottom, uh, about six lines from the bottom. And there you can understand what a rule is to understand language. We now know uh, people who are having a fixed idea of language are language insufficient. They lack understanding of the live language. The different spectra of autisms are there, as well as HDHD. They are sort of fixated in the static. Here, 
Let's see. This is why he states, I regard meaning something and following a rule as synonymous. Here, the connection between following rules and meaning something is made explicit. If our practice of following rules is related to the formation of our ways of seeing through aspect perception, then our linguistic practices as meaningful ones are also related to shape to the shaping of our ways of seeing through aspect perception. So you see here, meaning is a rule, so is object, and so is realer, realer, more real. I don't, I don't like more real, but realer, I make a superlative moving sense of it. And this goes to show why, as we know, proven, that the educational development in the West has stopped, often referred to as the closing of the Western mind. And also uh, the practices that we inherited from Christianity has also ceased to exist for the fixation and the staticness. Wittgenstein is showing that there is, as I mentioned, and will not go into this time, a picture under all of this. But this is the first step in getting to feel the shape of the picture, understanding it. Next page. Here we will go all the way to the bottom almost. Uh, the last paragraph before the quote, beginning with as. The before sight was from Wiener Ausgabe. As he notes, this must shows that someone has adopted a concept. And this is how Wittgenstein characterizes such a situation. This must means a circle. I decide to look at it look at things in this way. So even to learn a circle is a sort of development of aspect seeing that ends in a circle. And I can bet you that there will be inhabitants of the Brazilian rainforest who doesn't see circles until they train that very feature. This is very close to how Ian McKilchrist says it's an attitude to see the world as segmented or fragmented in the left hemisphere way. I would say it also takes some training to see it as a wholeness. It won't come by itself. But this is definitely... Uh, an entry into the uh, wholeness of the right hemisphere. And say Wittgenstein is a segue into that. So you understand the continuation of the series is to see a thing, a rule. All of a sudden, it springs to life. You 
the very last phrase before we stopped. No, it's on the next page, 72. Second paragraph, last line. You give an extension to the rule. And for anything to become real, the observer is there. You are there. Educational system doesn't become real. There is no knowledge without the observer. There is no understanding of the Bible in the passive platonic way at all. But if you are there, having a practice, developing, you are the extension of the rule. You're part of it. You're not outside of it. And this is also how it becomes real, both in quantum physics, which is the physics of the world, but we also have some pointers coming from the science of cognition and neurology. Much overdue, Kalle Lundahl, come into the scene. Hello, hello. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I think it's useful to repeat, uh, go back to the beginning of the paper and repeat acute and chronic theme. What was the difference or the definition in this paper? Um, let me see. Uh, acute entities, let me see. Ah. Acute, how do they def, uh, define acute thing? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I will find it. Um, ah, here, it's page 63, page 63. Acute and the chronic phases of aspectine, and it, we, we need to repeat this here a little bit. Um, when we extract a new aspect, or when we notice an aspect change, our seeing of an aspect is clearly in an acute phase. When a new aspect is dawning, we make a new comparison with an object or concept that we did notice, did we not notice earlier. That is, that a rabbit drawing could also be seen as a duck. Aspect seeing because continuous when we are seeing the same aspect time and time again. So that seeing it becomes a matter of course, chronic, so to say. At this phase, we are not usually aware that we are seeing an aspect. We are not normally seeing a picture of a person as a picture person, but as a person. With Wittgenstein's distinction between the acute and chronic phases of aspect seeing, a distinction that sheds some light on the scope of aspect seeing as well, is of the loop. Um, so the distinction is subtle. subtle. Uh, so when we notice something new, that is an acute phase. And I ask myself, so acute is, I don't know how to uh, put, give a synonym to acute. You can call you can call acute uh, sort of in the beginning, the first time it's when you first come upon it, so to speak, when it's fresh, mm -hmm, not mm -hmm, well fresh. established, not well established. Mm -hmm. Not well established. And then uh, we had the chronic when it's well established, to understand yes. correctly. Mm -hmm. You can also compare to uh, habituated, uh, I would call real, what we usually mm -hmm. call real. 
uh, without, uh, I, when I say real, I don't say it's less real in the acute phase, but real in the sense, uh, well, it's real, more real. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good explanation, Hans. Um, and I would like to now uh, take this and call to page um, 16, uh, 16 the PDF, let me see. Page 16, the PDF, it corresponds to, uh, let me see, uh, 71. Um, it was about um, the counting of eight and nine. Uh, here, on page 71. So, with and gives the following example. Imagine that you want to find out the result of eight times nine. One possible proof possibly consists in drawing eight row, rows of nine dots each, and then continuing the number of dots by pushing a chess figure around the rows of dots. Um, so uh, then you read, so to say, see that the result of 72, and gradually it becomes our law. Mm, yeah. so it's, like, it's like a child who learns to count. Uh, so my point is that uh, I would say, this is my challenge, <laughs> that um, seeing and um, is gradual, always. It's like when you count, of course, you, you forget the first phase that you, uh, how you are right to 72. Yes, you forget that. You forget the training, you forget the boring parts. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what you do. Uh, so, so, so I would say that you are already, already the word chronic, uh, the word time. And we know time, it shows that something is, is gradual. So chronic is not in platonic sense, the, the platonic time, the platonic time is something unchanging. Mm, yes, yes, yes. But the chronic, in uh, perhaps in Wittgenstein uh, sense, is is that is a learning process. Gradual. Yes. yes, it's constantly a development. There is no fixed point, and there is never uh, like uh, black and white, true or false or one or zero condition, never, never, never. Mm -hmm. It's a development. And real is a development. That's why I try to use this <laughs> rather clumsy word, word realer. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Sorry. But I, I, I really I want to point to that fact. And the rule you're pointing out, Herr Kalle, is the same as an object also. Hmm. You, you're actually experiencing something new. Hmm. Yes, uh, so perhaps these uh, two words, acute and chronic, oh, they are a little bit artificial in one way, uh, because both show uh, gradual developments. It can be sudden. Acute is more like sudden. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's say that you have to go in series, you say go to acute, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how, if you can try to translate into English, but it's something acute. You need to go quickly to the hospital and um, you see something fresh, okay, or if something bad happens quickly. It's a, like in a bit, uh, Heidegger's example is that when you are glasses broke, eyeglasses broke, mm. this is something acute, you see something new. Acute, it's something fresh, and then now you use, then your eyesight. Okay, you are you don't have eye classes for a, perhaps for a day or two before you return to the opti optician. So that is this uh, time without classes is the chronic time. Uh, so you have to uh, get used to, uh, but it's not constant. Perhaps in the beginning you see. Um, uh, more badly than you, you get used to, even though you need classes, you get used to, so yeah. it's not constant. Yeah. Hmm. 
You can also compare to what Ian McKilk has brought up uh, in his investigation of why, uh, when uh, the, in the Second Vatic Vatican Council they took out liturgy rituals from monasteries, we know that belief disappeared in that process. The mm. ability to believe, which is a growing thing, not a static thing. And uh, he also pointed to that after the process was finished, nobody did the liturgy. It went down to, I think, 5% of belief. If you mm. don't train it, if you don't do the things on a daily basis, it disappears. Mm. It's no longer there. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be trained, so to speak. I don't know if trained <laughs> is the right word, but repetition, uh, iteration, as I named uh, with the, in the context with the Spanish word for caña, uh, beer, needs mm -hmm. to be repeated in a different way. And it was replaced, uh, horribly replaced, by blasphemous one or zero taken actually from Newtonian classics classic physics, something that has nothing to do with Christianity. And all of a sudden, people said, you either have it or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's pure Newton. That's pure Newton. Mm -hmm. Taken directly from Newton, not existing before 1689. Very interesting. No, but because uh, let's say that you would not accept that you have a uh, gradual seeing in Wittgenstein, that would be like be becoming a Pentecostal. Oh. Yes, once saved, always saved, so it's uh, sudden uh, yeah. that you see once and then uh, it's no development. Hmm. Yeah, indeed. Mm. I'm afraid we have to stop here. It was, yes, yes. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you, Kalle Lundahl, for your magnificent uh, uh, comments and uh, insights. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. Have a very good day afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you are. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.